Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you are. Uh, my name is Christopher Patno, and I lead accessibility and disability inclusion for Google. And I'm pinch hitting here for our dear friend Robin Spinks, who's gotten sick. Um, I have the pleasure to have run a little fireside chat with my friends Christine and Josh, and I'll, I'll let you each introduce yourself. Christine? Thank you, Christopher. Um, lovely to meet you. Uh, it's Christine Hempiel from Open Inclusion. Um, I'm the founder and managing director of this organisation that really uh, looks to bring the voice, the experiences and the perspectives of disabled and older individuals into design and innovation. Josh. Thanks, Christine. Yeah, really delighted to be here. Uh, I support Christine at Open Inclusion as the Inclusive Innovation Program Lead. So basically taking control of everything to do with inclusive innovation, uh, of which we're going to talk a little bit today about building communities. So I'm going to start off with sort of the elephant in the room. With more than one billion people in the world with a disability, why is life so hard f for us? Why, why is the real world or, and the digital world so difficult? There are many reasons, but there's one underlying truth here that I think um, a bit of unlearning that needs to be done across the way we create things. And essentially, the design process and the innovation process, the making things or making them better, today doesn't work for most people with additional needs. And it's because the way in which both the practices of design work particularly the engagement with individuals, and we talk about human-centred design quite a lot, but human-centred design equally often fails people with disabilities and older individuals because it doesn't include people with specific additional needs as the humans at the centre of the design. So there's a process failure, there's also the people failure in that the communities creating things are often not nearly as diverse as the communities receiving those things. And then even once people have woken up to that, there is a ease failure, and that's the one that we've really tried to design into, which is once you're aware that the insights you're getting are missing a huge amount of experience, so you're paying for customer experience, but you're only getting the experience of some of your customers and you're not potentially even aware of who those customers are that are, miss are being missed in that insight. Um, there's an, once people are aware of that, it's not very easy to get that and to reach into the community in a way that is fair, inclusive, accessible and informative for better design. Josh, anything you wanted to add to that? I think it just goes back to the, 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 the not le nothing without us about us, so always making sure that we are including individuals with different perspectives and lived experiences of disability from the very outset. And if we get that correct and make sure that we implement that through every iterative stage of anything that we're working on when we are building products and services, then I think everybody from that point wins. So it's just going back to that good old mantra mm -hmm. of nothing about us without us. So if we acknowledge that there's a problem, it, it, some of it is awareness, some of it is, is, is the challenge to it. Okay, now I know what to do, but that seems really hard. Mm. How, what do you do then? And I think this is a really interesting question in inclusive insight is hard to actually engage with the community in a way that is delightfully accessible and inclusive and then informs design just at the points of design that are most useful and practical and efficient to improve things, today is really hard. And some of that's because the tools we're using, I think of it as three things actually, just to bring it together. There's a mindset problem, there's a skill set problem, and there's a tool set problem. So the mindset is being aware that we're potentially missing out on a lot of experience in the way that we're informing our designs today. Then there's a skill set, which is what skills do we need as you know for us as researchers, for designers, as designers, for innovators, as innovators, in order to ensure that the process of making things and making them better is more inclusive from the start and improving our skills around inclusive design and innovation and inclusive research. And then the third thing is the tools. So a lot of the tools that are, are used today for customer experience are actually quite exclusive. So people think, ah, oh, we've listened to all our customers. We've had, you know, uh, an expression I often use is the map is never the territory. So when we're listening to customers, we might have heard from 5,000 customers, wonderful. We've got 6 million customers or 400,000 customers who wasn't listened to. 
And is there some characteristic of similarity of those you have listened to that is not similar to those that you've not listened to? And if these two, what you've seen and heard and who you're trying to represent in what you've seen and heard are different and fundamentally different, there's a real flaw in that. So that's that tools that can more consistently, more inclusively and more fairly listen to the full breadth of, of the audience and of the customer base, employee base, whatever you're trying to, your citizen base that you're trying to un better understand. You, you mentioned pr process a, a moment ago. Um, the, the pr what is the best practice in terms of trying to build inclusively if you want to design? Is, is it testing it with people at the end? What, what does best practice look like when it comes to, to making an inclusive product or service? I mean, being a disability research organization, um, it's very much part of our ethos that we include disabled people or people with lived experience from the start. So as part of the global community that we've started to create, we've actually, we, 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 un we took from what we've learned in previous research and we use that as a foundation to really understand how we're going to go about building a community and making sure that we've you know, got the right mindset and got the right tools and resources around us in order to get us off the ground in the, in the right way. So we went through kind of a four stage approach which was very much starting off with the design in terms of understanding what is it that we want to build in order to benefit the community, this global community, um, for people to access. So understanding first what are their needs, what is it they want to be able to do, um, and then basically design the platform with those individuals to get their perspective on how this experience, how the emotion and the value that, that, that the community brings to them, not just the the way they use it, but also what it looks like as well, and in an accessible way. So it's very much designing at the beginning, including everyone at the start, then looking at analyzing. So the way we did this was we've kind of done it in, I would say we've probably done about four or five iterations or sprints, so very much using traditional agile project management speak. So making sure that we start off doing sprint one, so we design, we analyze, we implement, uh, or develop, sorry, and then implement, and then we're constantly evolving, going around in circles, and including the same people throughout the process. So we understood what the needs were, then we started doing research on accessible technologies, um, and then we kind of understood, were those technologies actually going to work for us? And then we realized, actually, then they, they don't necessarily meet the needs of the individuals that we're trying to, to, to uh, d develop this community platform for. And as we were doing the research, we were also including everyone to get their perspectives on their thoughts on whether or not it was going to work. So in order for us as a business to make key decisions, we were allowing the community to input their perspectives to help us make sure that we were making the decisions in the benefit of the community. So I think that's probably really, really what we've been doing throughout. If I can just uh, add a little bit to that, actually just to give people a little bit of context. In about, well, I'm looking at Josh here, five weeks time? Yes. We're going to be releasing <laughs> a global technology platform that underpins the community at Open that has been around since 1998. So we're a 25-year-old community of people with different lived experiences of disability and older age that we have been engaging with for inclusive research over that period of time but we were wanting to move beyond a very transactional relationship with this community where we asked them, would you be in, in, interested in being involved in this research and it's gonna take this amount of time and here's the incentives and all the information around it and it's very much monodirectional between us and an individual and back to being a community where we could add ongoing value to the community, where the community could add value to itself because if we're gonna build this thing, there's a lot of value that we're aware of and it's the reason that you, know, Christopher and I actually originally had this conversation a number of years ago because he being the very, very intelligent man he is had a very similar idea and went, I want to create connection across the community to allow the community to solve for its own needs. But because we were creating a platform, it's there and able to do that. And a lot of what Josh was just saying, where the rubber really hit the road is when we asked the community right at the beginning of this process, if we're going to create a pan-disability community that's technically enabled so you can engage with each other and we can bring different propositions to it and you can bring different 
you know, elements of your capability that you might wish to to it, what would be relevant? And what was fascinating is some of the things we got back were not what we expected and we actually had to stop and redesign. And in fact, we completely rewrote some of the early proposition elements on the basis of that. So mm. it's not easy, but it's powerful. <laughs> it's very hard um, and we can't avoid that fact. But I think the way in which we come is we come at it with the right intent um, and we see, we see hard things as opportunities to overcome and I think that's what we really thrive on because we know that the impact and the benefit that it has when we get it right is going to be phenomenal. So I think that's really kind of what motivates us to get through the harder parts. Um, but I also think that there's this non-transactional value, isn't there, as well, in which we're trying to get out of this. So making it for and by the community rather than getting the community in just for something specific, we actually empower them so that they're not having to give something in an exchange for something. It's benefiting each other. If I can reach in here, so it's, it's yeah. the program manager brain that I have, but it's, you know, we discussed all the, the process all the way to launching a product, mm -hmm. but what I've learned in my, in my time doing this is you need to listen to the community afterwards and roll that back in. Do you have any, any best practices on how to take feedback after you've created something so it can get rolled into the, into the process? Yeah, so we've very much factored in how this community is going to be self-sustaining going forward by the community. And what we have here at Open Inclusion is a community of panel leads that represent different areas of the, the disability community. Um, and effectively, what we're going to be looking at doing is making the community leads within our community help moderate and control and provide support back to the community so that really it's the community empowering themselves to do that. Um, and what we have done as well as part of the, the design and the research of pulling all this platform together is making sure that we've then got an internal support team in place to help the moderators um, that are going to be moderating the community. So we, 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 we're trying to make sure that we've got accessible support in place, whether it be uh, providing BSL or ASL language, whether it be providing um, uh, text relay. We've made sure that we've got that support framework there. And I think really the proof is when we actually launch this thing and really get it going that you know, we probably are going to expect some failures, but actually that's okay. It's how we then address them as a team going forward and the community having the awareness that actually we're doing our best. If I can just add to that, you know, we're going to fail. And Josh, for all the incredible work, you know, we've done, there's going to be things that we get wrong and actually we've designed into the community spaces for people to say, can we add a new element to this? That's already designed in there today because we know we're not going to get them all right. Um, equally, the community leaders are going to be incredibly important, not just for sharing to the community how people might engage and helping people navigate through, especially as they're learning it in the first place, but also listening and saying, where are we getting this wrong? Where is it difficult? either people coming through the support side or coming to the community leaders and saying, I'm finding this challenging or I wish I could find something. And in fact, even on the research side, we've designed in two elements where people can share with us areas that they'd like us to do research and they think that there's a really, you know, a really powerful unmet need that they're aware of. So making sure that there's enough listening posts, despite all of that, we're still going to get it wrong. And um, that's why we're releasing it in lots of different layers. So actually it's now released to a small group of beta testers in a closed kind of beta. It'll be released to one part of our community. We're gonna start with the US community in about five weeks time. It'll then be released to the UK community and then we'll roll it out globally um, you know, to, uh, to other members. But it's, right. it's gonna happen in layers and we're going to tell anyone who's coming on at the beginning, please be kind to us, but also please be very honest with us because that's what we'll need to get it right. I, I think that honesty and, and, and willingness to be sensitive and willingness to be vulnerable to, uh, to, and humble to the feedback that comes in from the community is, is, is a critical part of the work that you're doing. Um, we have less than a minute to go, so I just want to do a very quick wrap up of sort of the themes that I've gotten from our conversation. The first is recognizing that there's an opportunity and a challenge. There's over one billion people in the world who have a disability that, that, that can be profoundly helped with thoughtful technology. The second is once you're aware of it, you need to take action and realize it's gonna be harder than you think and then you need to engage the community during the process. You wanna co-create, you wanna co-design, you wanna test. But the most important thing is you also want to listen to the feedback coming at the end because 
once you've launched a product or a service, for you it might feel like the end, but for the rest of the world it's the beginning. So recognize the value of the feedback that comes in, see it as a gift, act on the feedback, and you can create something that really helps everyone do what they need, where they are, and when they are. Thank you, Christine. Thank, Thank you, you, Josh, for a wonderful conversation, and welcome to Zero Conference. Thank you. Thank you.